morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm glad that you're here. Are you glad to be here? I like to see the smiling faces. I'm sorry I can't see your faces with these masks. You know, when we get to heaven, there will be no masks. There will be no COVIDs of any sort. There will be nothing that will cause us any kind of pain. Isn't that marvelous? My Bible says, your Bible says, that God has prepared for us something that we can't even imagine. I remember when I was growing up, I lived in the island of Bermuda. And uh, <clears throat> I would have tourists come there. It was a tourist place. Still is, and they can't get there now because of this COVID thing. But uh, I had many tourists see me. I was a young child coming up, 10, 12. Ride my bicycle along, and stop, and they'd ask you questions sometimes. And they would tell me, this is such a beautiful place. And I used to think to myself, I don't see nothing special about it. That's all I knew. Then I left. Bermuda, and I went to the city of New York, and then I thought to myself, Bermuda is a beautiful place. <laughs> yes, God is good to us. Today I wanted to share a verse that you know very well, <clears throat> John 3.16. I'll probably look at it in a way that you probably haven't looked at it for a while. With along with some other verses in the Bible. Before we get there, though, we want to pray. I have about five different themes running through my mind. I need to stick to this one. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We praise you because you are the one that we need in these times of difficulty. Lord, I actually just hide me and speak to us through your word. We're making choices today that will affect us tomorrow. May our choices always be directed by your Holy Spirit. And as David prayed, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John 3.16, let's say it together. You know that verse, don't you? Four. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have. I want to focus on two points in this verse. Perish. Everlasting life. Two ways. Perish. Everlasting life. Take your Bible and you go, if you wish you follow, follow me, I'm going to go to a couple of verses in the scriptures to point out this first about perishing. Jesus died so we do not have to perish. Now that perish doesn't talk about, it's not talking about six feet in the ground, it's talking about perish forever. The second death for sin. The first death is because of sin. But the second death, we choose. If you were here for Sabbath school, you heard my story about that. Jeremiah 21, verse 8 reads, New King James Version. Now you shall say to this people, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I set before you the way of life. And the way of death. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verse 15. God speaking through Moses says. See I have set before you today life and good. Death and evil. Romans 6 23. You know that verse 2. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Life, death, the choice is ours. 
Did you realize that? We choose to live forever or we choose to die forever. There's a comment that I found in the Spirit of Prophecy that in the book of Early Writings, and it reads this way. I saw that the angels of God are never to control the will. Period. Who controls our will? We do. God sets before men life and death. He, man, can have his choice. Many desire life, but still continue to walk in the broad road that they choose to rebel against God's government, notwithstanding his great mercy and compassion in giving his son to die for them. Those who do not choose to accept the salvation so dearly purchased must be punished. But I saw that God would not shut them up in hell to endure endless misery, neither will he take them to heaven. For to bring them into the company of pure and holy would make them exceedingly miserable. I'll stop there. I'm sure that there's someone here, maybe many of you, maybe all of you have had the experience of, let me ask this question first. How many of you have become Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Can you raise your hand? Ah, most of you. Wonderful. So the next question will be relevant. I'd ask that to make sure. How many of you having become Seventh-day Adventist Christians practicing what you know the Bible says have had folks withdraw from your circle of friendship. Raise your hand. Uh, why did they withdraw? You know? Did they tell you? Maybe not. I like to suggest why. You made them feel bad and or look bad. Just being yourself. Trying to be like Jesus. So they withdrew. That was their choice. You see, God says, I can't take them to heaven because they would be miserable there. No bars. No McDonald's. You don't use McDonald's. Um, I'm not going to make a long list because i got to watch the clock. But it says, but he will destroy them utterly and cause them to be as if they had not been. Then his justice will be satisfied. He formed man out of the dust of the ground and the disobedient unholy will be consumed by fire and returned to dust again. I saw that the benevolence and compassion of God in this matter would lead all to admire his character and to adore his holy name. After the wicked are destroyed from the earth, all the heavenly hosts will say, Amen. I'm sure this because I have people that I've visited with in church, in our churches, have the mistaken idea that God will never destroy people. The Bible is very, very clear on that in my mind. But God is not in the business of destroying anyone. His business is saving people. You agree? That's why Jesus died. But God has given to you and I and all of his intelligent beings choice. 
He never, ever forces. He says, this is life, this is death. Choose life. Sin, the more I study, the more I come to understand a little bit about how much God must hate sin. Sin destroys. It hurts. Look around us. People self-destruct. And those who are in the process of destroying themselves are very adamant in helping to destroy somebody else. I pray that God will help those of us who have been saved will be as anxious to save others as those that are destroying themselves are willing to destroy others. A lot of the problem that we are experiencing today in our society, I believe in part, is our fault. You agree with me? It's our fault. Why? Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your head. I just want you to think with me. How many people this week have you told about Jesus' love for them? Just think. And these society's norms as they're being formed about wearing masks and Staying distance is a way is contributing to the easiness of not telling somebody about God's love. Yes, Satan is clever. But a telephone still works. Do you know that viruses doesn't travel from phone to phone? Did you know that? So the path of the wicked, of those who are disobedient to God, leads to eternal death. That's the second death. I want to explain that now. Because there are some people who don't understand that we die twice. You know what? So maybe you understand, but maybe someone who's going to watch this will not understand that people die twice. The first time we die, all of us die because we all are sinners. And all of us have sinned. The consequences are, we live in a world where death is a part of our existence. And everyone knows from the time they're old enough to understand that grandpa died, a bird died, my kitty got killed, death is a reality. We cannot control that death. This virus that people are terrified about, it amazes me that they're so upset that they report it so consistently and so righteously every day, all day long. Just two or three people out of a hundred thousand die. Maybe nine or ten. That many die from the flu. More people die from cancer. More people die from diabetes. More people die from car accidents. More people die from the worst number one killer. You know what that is in the world? Abortion. They don't tell you how many people were aborted today and how many people, they don't give you that information. This virus, yeah. And since most people don't think, they just swallowed hook, line, and sinker. <gasps> can't go to there, I can't do that, I can't. I can go to the store, I go out to eat, but I can't go to church because I might get infected. That's enough about that. I want to look at another passage before, because the clock is running me. So let's go to Galatians chapter 5 and look at 
the series of people who make bad choices that lead to death. Then I want to go to the other side of the coin and look about life. Because the path that leads to life, and that's the path we are on and want to stay on. Amen? All right, here we go. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verses 19 all the way down to 21. Just list a bunch of things that God has listed. Paul writes, says, these I will make it. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand just as I tell you, I told you in time past, those who practice such things, what's the last part saying? Will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that clear? Doesn't say they might. Doesn't say they have a second chance. It's very definite. They will not enter the kingdom of God. So those people that are out there breaking up things, burning up things, protesting about this and protesting about that, hurting people, my Bible says they are not going to heaven. Didn't they want to say? Now, in my mind, the sad part is most of them don't know that. They don't know that. They have been led to believe a lie. And they are of the opinion that if I can force people to do this, what I want, everything's going to be okay. But if there's force involved in anything, God is not in it. The devil's behind it. Do we understand that? So it amazes me that I know of several church members that are saying, rah, rah, let's go. Running down the path to death. I don't want that for them. I pray tell nobody here is involved in that. But God won't force you not to do that. You have a choice. He will respect your choice. But remember, he died so you do not have to perish. Right? The verse says, but that all can have eternal life. I have a list of things here of those that are on that path to destruction. They're living people. But notice the kind of life they live. Just a few descriptives here. They have little faith or no faith in God. They are disobedient to God's law. They are not faithful at all. They are very unfaithful folks to most of whatever they say they're going to do. Dishonest. Remember, Jesus warned us about being deceived in the last days. That's present today like never before. They suffer. They're very self-indulgent. I found that statement I've been telling you about, or I referenced the other day, and I'll read it for you now. Selfishness is death. Here it is. Desire of Ages, page 417, paragraph 2. Whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whoever shall lose his life for my sake, Jesus speaking, and the Gospels, the same shall save it. Selfishness is death. 
No organ, here's the illustration that is so, so well applied. No organ of the body could live should it confine its service to itself. The heart failing to send its lifeblood to the hand and to the head would quickly lose its power. As our lifeblood, so is the love of Christ diffused through every part of his mystical body. What's the mystical body of Christ? The church. We are members of one another, and the soul that refuses to impart will perish. Our Sabbath school lesson today was about what? Witnessing. Notice the statement here. Members are one, we are members of one another, and the soul that refuses to impart or witness will perish. And what is a man profited, Jesus says, if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Our world is passing away. It's waxing old like a garment. It says in some place in science, I believe it is. It's wearing out. Jesus is about to come. Do we want him to come? What are we doing to help him? Now let's go to the... Now let me finish my little list here. Those who are going down the path to death suffer now. And they have lots of sorrow and pain. They're practicing, and I read the passage to you. I'm not going to read it again. Galatians 5, 19, the lust of the flesh. And Proverbs says, good understanding gains favor, Proverbs 13, 15, but the way of the transgressor or the unfaithful is hard. I've read the text in Proverbs, King James Version says the way of the transgressor is hard. The New King James says the way of the unfaithful is hard. Six one half dozen the other. Because a person who is unfaithful suffers problems. Does he not? If you're not sure about that, you go buy a house, buy a car, and agree, and you sign on the dotted line saying that I'm going to pay for the car, let's say, $289 a month. They gave you the car. Here's the key. And so you drive, you pay one month, you pay two months, you pay three months, and then you say, oh, so I don't think I'm going to pay this month. So you skip a month. And they call you up. Hey, you missed your payment. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. The next month comes up. Well, I think I, I got to do this. I think I'm going to go on my trip over here to New York. So I'm going to go. I'll use my car money to go. So I go two months now. I ain't paid. Next month, something else comes along. And you say, you're unfaithful servant. Again, third month, you don't pay to your car. Being unfaithful, transgressing God's law causes us problems. So the world, those who are on the road to destruction in this life are miserable. But let's go to the way of life because we've got to finish on a positive note. Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever, who does that include? Everyone. Does it include those guys with margin for, what is it, uh, Black Lives Matter? Or the, what's the other group called? The, um, Atifa? Does it include that group? The murderers on Skid Row, or whatever row it is. They can have the benefit of salvation if they will surrender their life to Christ. My Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, I think it's verse 25, God is able to save to the uttermost. 1 John 1, 9 says, and if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us from some of our sins. Is that what it says? All of our sins. So the salvation that God is offering us is available to everybody. 
but it's their choice. Now the life now for those who are choosing to accept the gift. They obey God's law. They keep all the commandments. So they don't steal, they don't kill, they don't tell lies. They remember to keep God's name in vain. They don't do that. They, they keep it holy and they speak it respectfully, reverently. They keep the Sabbath day holy. They are in church. You're here today. God is number one in their life. As the text was mentioned by my wife earlier this morning, seek first God's kingdom. And the promise is, I'll give you all you need. So their life is full. Because they've come to know Jesus, there's a joy and a peace and a contentment. If they have a lot, praise the Lord. If they have a little, praise the Lord. Because they are content. Jesus is in charge of their life. They're honest people. What they say you can take to the bank because they're not going to lie. And then back in Galatians 2. Let's go back to Galatians. You're still there in chapter 6, chapter 5. They practice the fruit of the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is in charge of their life. Notice what they, their character looks like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. They're loving people. Joy. They're happy people. Peace. They can go to sleep at night and rest comfortably because they have peace in their heart. Long suffering. They don't get upset, bent out of shape. The patient. Long suffering. Gentle people. They know how to control themselves. And I would like to verify that. It's a self-control in the fact that what have they done? Paul says, I have been crucified. I have crucified myself to, with Christ. And yet, I live. But not I, but Christ lives in me. So for them, their self-control is governed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit running their experience because that's what they have chosen. Continuing it says, they're faithful. They make all car payments and say they don't lose their car or their house. Gentle, self-control. Then it says they're against such. There is no law. So those on the path to life eternal have a joyful life right now. Right? Do they have problems? Yes. Do they worry about the problems? No. Why? God's in charge. If I got to go to sleep, you know, I was thinking the other day, they said, I'm going to kill somebody comes up to me and says, Simmons, if you don't give up this crazy idea about your Sabbath and your whatever they want to put over my head at the time, we're going to blow you away. And I've been thinking about how am I going to respond to that? And I come to the conclusion I can say this. Have at it. Go ahead. The God that I serve, you take my life, you can give it back to me. Do you believe that? Does our lives reflect that? You see, there's only two ways. Now, I can go back through the Bible as we conclude. Let's run through the twos in the Bible. It starts in Genesis. Cain and Abel. Two groups. Abraham's descendants and everybody else. Two groups. Children of Israel and all the others. Two groups. You come to the New Testament, wheat, tares. Right? All the way through the Bible, there's always given us two choices. And Moses, or oh not Moses, I'll take you Joshua's content. Joshua, as he's about to give up his position and give up his life, he was about to die. And Joshua makes this comment. To the children of Israel. I like the close of that today. Joshua 24 verse 15. 
And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served that were in the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you serve the Lord? We have a choice, folks. I like to suggest that you're making a choice on one of those roads every day, all day, all day long. Life is a series of continual choices. You realize that? You got up this morning, the alarm, if you set the alarm went off, you had two choices, slap it or get up. You got up, you had another choice. Am I going to the bathroom first or am I going to get a, maybe a drink of water first? Am I going to wear the blue suit, no suit, a tie, no tie? I'm going to wear the red dress or the blue dress or the brown dress or the white dress. You've made a choice. I'm going to have breakfast or I'm not going to have breakfast. If I'm going to have breakfast, I'm going to have cornflakes or I'm going to have oatmeal. Choices. I'm going to leave on time to be at Sabbath school on time or I'm going to be late to get to Sabbath school on time. I made a choice. Do you get it? Choices all day long. You have two cars. Two cars. I'm going to use this one or I'll use that one. I'll take one. You bring the other one there because I'm going to go early. You've got to come late. Choices. God says choose life. I'm lying out before you two paths. One leads to eternal life. And one leads to eternal death. And in the process, we are preparing to receive the reward of our choices to go one of two different directions. Personally, I want to spend eternity enjoying my time with Jesus. I don't wish to become nothing forever. And that's the alternative for those who say, no, Lord, I'll do it my way. So I want to ask you as we close down, how many is going to say, Lord, I choose today to follow Jesus' example. Raise it high. Now I have a song and I, I, I Bob, I should have placed it Back there for you to play, but I bought a CD with me today. And you've heard the song, I'm sure. But I'm going to play this for you. I love the song. So you know you're going to be indulged the past to hear his song, okay? But it's called Jesus. Jesus. If I hit the right button, it'll play. Turn up the volume so you can hear it. Because it can make some noise.
the storm, heal the broken, raise the dead. At the name of Jesus, I've seen sin-hardened men melted, derelicts transformed, the lights of hope put back into the eyes of a hopeless child. I've heard a mother softly breathe his name at the bedside of a child, delirious with fever, and I've watched that little body grow quiet and the fevered brow cool. I've sat beside a dying friend, her body wrecked with pain, who in those final fleeting seconds summoned her last ounce of strength to whisper Earth's sweetest name, Jesus. Emperors have tried to destroy it. Philosophies have tried to stamp it out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of this earth with the very blood of those who claimed it. Yet the name of Jesus still stands. And there shall be in that final day when every voice that has ever uttered a sound, every voice of Adam's race, shall proclaim in one great mighty chorus the name of Jesus. For every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you see, it was not mere chance that caused the angel one night long ago to say to a virgin maiden, His name shall be called Jesus. Jesus. You know, there's something. Something about that name. something about that name is it not he will keep us he'll take us through folks he just wants our choice choose you this day whom you will serve we'll let that be our closing song and let's bow our heads for the prayer Lord we choose Jesus today and again because yesterday's choice wasn't good enough for today so we choose again today to say, Lord, you be in charge of our loom, our homes, our hearts, our actions, our thoughts, that our life would be a reflection of your life in honoring and glorifying you. And as we share this wonderful news, Jesus is coming and he loves us and he'll forgive us for whatever we've done with our neighbors and friends. Help us to put a smile on your face during this next week. Many times. As we cheer and share the wonderful news that your coming is soon. Thank you for your forgiveness. And now as we go our different way, we ask your blessing upon this people. Bless each one according to their special need just now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.